Hello again and welcome back to Link's Awakening DX. This is part 4 and I've just cleared through level 4, so now I'm going to be heading to levels 5 and 6 in this video. Yes, this video wound up being a little bit long, but after doing the editing for level 5 I thought the video would be too short and we did already pick up the key to level 6 in a previous video, so I figured let's do two in one video this time, even if it does wind up being just a bit lengthy. So in that cave, you can actually find a piece of heart under the water. Now that we can swim, there are a bunch of places to go and items to find, including some very well-hidden pieces of heart. I have no idea how anyone was supposed to know to dive in that one specific room. I suppose you might find it if you randomly dive after falling into that cave, because you can fall into that cave from up the mountain later on in the game. And in this cave, you can find a sunfish. That's apparently what the word Monbo means, and he's got a song for us. This is the second song you can learn. However, strangely, when you play it on the ocarina, it doesn't sound anything like the tune that's going right now. Anyways, this is a really weird song. It is actually the fast travel song of this game, but it can only teleport you to one location. Unless you're in a dungeon, of course. If you play it in a dungeon, it will actually send you back to the dungeon entrance without having to save, quit, and reload, which is pretty convenient. But then again, you could just save, quit, and reload, but whatever. Mumbo's Mumbo. I hope that's some kind of pun, because I don't know what a Mumbo is. Actually, it's a kind of dance, I think. Anyways, uh, you can play it on the Ocarina at any time in the overworld and be sent all the way to this random pond in front of Crazy Tracy's place. I have no idea what the connection is. Uh, anyways, that can be very convenient. It would be nice if it sent you all the way back to the village, actually, but I suppose we'll just have to make the trek back ourselves. And what's this? After you've cleared level 4, a ghost suddenly starts following you around on every screen, and I was thinking that he might have something to say if I just stand in front of him for a little bit, but he wasn't saying anything, so let's just move on to where you're supposed to take him. Eventually, I think the ghost tells you to bring him to this house. It's the abandoned house near the shoreline. This has got to be one of the weirdest moments in the entire game. I really don't know what's up with this. After clearing the fourth dungeon, they just have this ghost follow you around, and then you have to bring him to his abandoned house and then to his grave elsewhere in the game. I really don't know what the purpose is, but now that I think about it, level 5 doesn't have a key or anything you need to get into the dungeon. You can just go there straight away, so they needed something to fill time between levels 4 and 5, so they came up with this. I guess that's what the purpose of it is, I really don't know. But hey, at least you can play Mumbo's Mumbo and wind up very close to his grave, so that song is already getting some use. Although I should say that in the menu it's actually really annoying to select the ocarina, because if the cursor goes over the ocarina, then you actually have to either press up or down to move the cursor away from the ocarina, otherwise the game will think you're trying to pick a song. That always annoyed me. I tend to keep the ocarina low on the menu as a result. You can control where items are placed on the menu. Anyways, here we are. This lone gravestone far away from the graveyard is where the ghost was apparently buried. I still have no idea who this guy is, and the game never tells you or mentions him ever again. Suddenly, the owl shows up. He has nothing to say about this. It hasn't been that long since we've seen Mr. Owl, has it? Maybe it has been. He tells us where the next dungeon is, and uh, not much else. Really no purpose to that meeting other than to point us in the right direction, but immediately after you can get a photograph next to the grave. I don't know why you would want to take a picture there, but it is a prime opportunity from some spooky photo shenanigans because, as you'll see when the very small mouse takes the photo, man, he looked really small compared to Link there, nothing at all like on the overworld. Anyways, he snaps the photo and suddenly the ghost is there. Fabulous. I suddenly feel cursed. Anyways, I was looking up heart piece locations and it turns out that I did in fact miss something in this cave, which is located in the prairie. It turns out that there is an unmarked bombable wall right here. I have no idea how anyone was supposed to find that. It's a good thing that there are only 12 heart pieces in the game because nobody would be able to find them all and actually assemble a decent life meter unless they looked up a guide. Anyways, that's the second full heart container, so there are only four more heart pieces to go. And now that we can swim, you can actually get to this small platform near the entrance to level 3 where there is a seashell under the bush. However, very annoyingly, it tends to bounce into the water after you cut the bush, 
So make sure you cut the bush from above, that's how you prevent the seashell from falling into the water. And I thought by lifting up the shell you would not cause it to fall into the water or anything, but it turns out it still bounces away from you even if you lift it up, so the key is to uh, hit it from above. Weird seashell. And speaking of weird items, now that we can swim, it's time to dive into the water here. This little river leads all the way to the castle, whatever it was called, I forgot the name. But you can swim in the castle's moat if you swim through this river. And if you head all the way south, this is again another heart piece that I have no idea how you're supposed to find it. But on this screen, not this one, but the one right below it... It just takes a while to swim there, okay? Dive under the water at this exact position to get the ninth heart piece! Okay. Yeah, no idea how anyone was supposed to know that's there. But it is there. So go and get it if you want. And we return to the animal village to continue with the trading quest because the hibiscus that we picked up can be used to uh, sweeten this lady right here. This goat girl wants a hibiscus for some reason. And in exchange for the flower, she decides to give you a letter to deliver to a one Mr. Wright. Now, Mr. Wright is a very interesting character. He is based on Will Wright from SimCity. Now, as I understand it, SimCity is not a Nintendo game, so this is one of the weirdest cameos in the entire game. But if I understand it correctly, the character was actually created specifically for the Super Nintendo port of SimCity, so Nintendo may be the rights holders for the character's design. And that would make sense, as there is in fact a Will Wright trophy in Super Smash Bros. Melee. So, I don't know if they kept the trophy in Brawl or anything, or the later Smash games, but you deliver him the letter and it's got a photograph attached. And the photograph is of Princess Peach instead of the goat. Mr. Wright doesn't know that he's pen pals with a goat. I guess that's a... That's always a funny little gag, isn't it? And we have yet another cameo by a Mario character, Peach this time, or Toadstool as she was known back then, which makes me wonder if the Super Mario RPG remake is going to keep the name Toadstool or switch it over to Peach like it was in the Japanese version this entire time. I'm thinking the latter. So in exchange for giving him the letter, you get a broomstick, nice reward, and you might think you're supposed to take it to the witch, but you're actually supposed to take it to this old lady who apparently lost her old broomstick, and after giving it to her, you get a fish hook. These rewards are getting more and more ridiculous, I swear. So we'll have to find something to do with the fish hook. So it looks like it's time to dive into the water yet again and move on with the game. I mean, where else would you do anything with a fish hook but the water, right? So swim down this river and into the location known as Martha's Bay, named after a mermaid that swims around here. Get ready for another funny localization change, this game's full of them. Anyways, in order to advance the trade quest, we need to swim under a bridge, and shockingly, there is not a troll here. It is in fact a fisherman, who might be kind of a troll based on what item you get from him. So, when you give him the fish hook, he will attempt to fish something up again. Now, in the localized versions of the game, it happens to be Martha's Necklace, which she randomly lost. In the Japanese version, and I think also the German version, it is instead Martha's Bikini Top. I am not kidding you. Go on the CuttyRoomFloor.net and find it for yourself. It's the most hilarious thing ever. This guy literally stole Martha's Bikini Top, and you have to give it back to her, because then... She won't come out of the water without it. Really embarrassed, you see? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, if she stays in the water, she's gonna wind up getting assaulted by all of those Zoras, and I don't want to think about what I just said anymore. So that's why she's so desperate to get the necklace back, because it was originally a bikini top, and, uh... In exchange, she lets you take one of her scales, which I think would be even more... Wacko than the bikini top? I don't know. I, I think I should stop talking about this. We'll learn what the scale does later, though. It doesn't let you dive further. And since the entrance to level 5 is literally right there, might as well go and uh, see what's up inside of the Catfish's Maw, a cave literally shaped like a Catfish's Maw. I hope that's not a live catfish. Because uh, that would mean that the Catfish's Maw predates going inside the Whale in Ocarina of Time. 
Anyways, the dungeons get a little bit more confusing starting from level 5 onwards, and uh, that resulted in me getting lost, because I didn't look up a walkthrough and plan my exact movements through every dungeon, I kind of just went semi-blindly, because obviously I've played the game before, but I don't remember the route you're supposed to take throughout the entire dungeon. These enemies in particular, they are the equivalent of the Dark Deaths from Zelda 1, and oh no, the compass! I've been foiled again! I guess this gives me time to talk about those enemies. Like with Dark Nuts, you have to hit them from behind. Uh, hitting them from the front or the sides will just cause your sword to bounce off of them. And it's really annoying because the hit detection on those guys is really, really annoying. If you swing your sword and it comes even close to the sides of the creature, then it's going to just bounce off. Like with Dark Nuts, back in Zelda 1, you could only thrust your sword forward. So it was very simple to get around their guard. You just have to get behind them and uh, stab at them. So it's good to try and find alternate items for defeating those enemies, and luckily this dungeon has such an item. But first, after solving this very easy puzzle, you can grab a key. And this room with the skull tiles on the floor is completely empty, but it will be a room that we should come back to later. See, this is the first dungeon in the series, actually, to have a sort of overarching gimmick or theme, which became very common from Ocarina of Time onwards. And I guess it's not really that much of a gimmick or theme, but I do actually like this dungeon for what it does. It does something really cool, which we will find out about later. As you can see, I'm trying to poke the enemies with my sword, but it's not really working. Even though it seems like I should be able to poke them with my sword from behind, or maybe from the side, it's not working out that well. So with that key, you can open this door and access the rest of the dungeon. There sure are a lot of Stalfos around here, seems to be a theme with this dungeon, and there's also some water as well. Very soon we'll be coming up on the mini-boss. It might seem like it's very early in the dungeon for the mini-boss to appear all of a sudden, but that is part of the dungeon's gimmick. First, let me describe this guy. This is the Master Stalfos, and you fight him the same way you fight the Stalfos in A Link to the Past. Hit him with your sword to make him collapse, and then hit him with a bomb do this a couple of times, and eventually he will actually flee the arena instead of dying immediately. Although in my case I should probably be careful with my bomb count. I don't know if there are any bomb pickups in here, so I should be careful with how many I have left. Probably would have been a good idea to stock up on bombs. You can carry up to 30 at the start of the game. So instead of finding the dungeon item in the chest, you actually find a note from the mini-boss saying that he's got the treasure, and if you want it, you'll have to defeat him. That's the gimmick of this dungeon. You have to chase the mini-boss all over the place in order to get the dungeon item from him, and I think this is a really cool concept. Now, you do have to fight him in specific places in a specific order, which would have been annoying, however the developers left a helpful hint for you. In each of the rooms where you can fight the mini-boss, there are blocks placed in the corners. The number of blocks indicates the order that you're supposed to visit those rooms in. Before fighting the mini-boss for the first time, I discovered the room with four blocks in it, which means that is where we will fight him for the final time. The only thing is, the fight doesn't really change that much each time you fight him. He's still got the same basic moveset, and you still beat him in basically the same way each time. So, not that interesting of a mini-boss, but I do like the concept. I think it's very good. So in this room, there were enemies on the other side of that wall of blocks. However, I had entered from the other side and killed them already. If you have not done this, then you can push those blocks and access the other side of the room and kill the enemies there to open the door up. And in this room, after passing through the place where we will be fighting the Master Stalfos for the third time, you can find the map, which is probably helpful. That'll let you uh, find where you're supposed to be going a little easier. You'll notice a lot of jump cuts and transitions to other clips. That's because uh, I did get just a teensy bit lost trying to find out where I was going, and very frequently I wound up having to backtrack because I would get to a room with a locked door and I have to go back to find the key, or maybe there was some puzzle that I couldn't solve without an item found later on. Anyways, here's the second round with the Master Stalfos. Just uh, slash him, you can get a very easy hit on him as soon as he drops down. And if you hit him from the right, he's actually blocking from the left because of that shield, so attacking from the left is the better option. It's actually very interesting. 
Link himself actually has a blind spot with his sword, if you can believe it. A weird quirk of Link's movement in Game Boy Zelda is that he cannot swing his sword down and to the right. Like, if you spin around and slash your sword a bunch, you'll notice that he never swings down and to the right. That's specifically because of how his animations work. Because the left and right sword swinging animations are mirrored, there's actually no animation for swinging down and to the right. So if you want to hit any enemies down and to the right, you have to use a spin attack. It's a really weird quirk. It doesn't really affect much, but I thought it was worth noting. Could be nice if some enemies had a way to take advantage of that blind spot, but they generally don't. Anyways, after round 3 with the Master Stalfos, if you want to get to where round 4 takes place very quickly, simply use the Warp Song to send yourself back to the beginning of the dungeon, and then head into the room where he is. Now, I think there's normally supposed to be a bit of dialogue here, but if you slash him immediately, I think that skips over the dialogue. So, you can simply uh, start the fight immediately, and... Uh, Trap him in the corner and bomb him a bunch. I hope I have enough bombs for this. I've only got two left. I accidentally used one in the interim between getting to this room and warping back to the beginning. But it turns out I did have enough and you get the dungeon item from him. It's the Hookshot, another item originating from A Link to the Past. Well, you'll be very happy to have the Hookshot in this game because it is actually incredibly overpowered. Enemies that would normally dodge or block the sword cannot do a thing in the face of the hookshot. It's completely overpowered. Naturally, it takes the shields off those enemies that block their heads that I just mentioned being very annoying to deal with. So as you can see, you can just hookshot the Stalfos. Apparently, he's unable to dodge out of the way. Very, very easy and simple. And of course, with the hookshot, you can uh, connect yourself to objects in the world. Those blocks that are just about everywhere and chests are some of the items that you can hook onto. And annoyingly, in this room right here, you have the weird crystals that you have to smash with the Pegasus Boots. I have no idea why they're even there. It just seems like a trap to cause that dialogue to appear if you accidentally push into one of them. So in this room, you can dive under the water and find a passageway to another part of the dungeon. And hey, there are some blooper enemies from the Mario series. Yet another Mario cameo and uh, Link definitely deals with these guys much, much easier than Mario did. Anyways, once we're through there, you can use the hookshot to extend this bridge all the way to you so that you can cross and pick up the boss key. Now we just need to find the boss room and we can get out of here. Unfortunately, there is a lot more ground to cover on the way to the boss room because there are a bunch of chests that I decided to get thinking they would be keys. It turns out it's just a bunch of rupees. But it looks like we will be needing all of these rupees for something, otherwise the game wouldn't give us so many, so uh, we'll uh, have to see what that is later. There's a key in this room at least, and there is a bomb pickup there as well, so there is a way to get more bombs if you start to run out. And uh, I very awkwardly try to get past those traps. Did you see how those traps didn't collide into each other? They actually stopped just short. Or maybe that's my imagination, but looking over the clip over and over, yeah, they do stop just short of hitting each other. It's really strange. Anyways, you can see me defeating that annoying enemy with a hookshot. You don't even need to pull the mask off their face. You can just hit them from the sides with a hookshot and you're good. Now, this room only contained the stone beak, though, so I don't really need any hints, but that room did have another bomb pickup, which I should probably be getting because I've got zero bombs. And that was an arrow pickup. Huh. That's strange. We haven't seen head or tail of the bow yet. Oh yeah, you're supposed to cross over this gap with the hookshot, by the way. That lets you avoid damage completely. But with a couple of well-timed jumps, you can make your own solution to the developer's puzzles. And in this room, we have another key and another arrow pickup. I sure hope the game doesn't expect me to have the bow here, because... That would be really awkward. I don't have the bow, and I would have to go all the way back to the village to get it, because it's actually at the shop. You can purchase it there. At any rate, there's a fairy under that pot, and it decided to be very annoying and fly off to the left. So, I had to wait a little while for it to come back so I could pick it up. And then I accidentally went off screen without picking it up. But it's just as well because the mini-boss, as it turns out, is Goma, a monster that you can only kill with the bow and arrow. So I had to backtrack all the way to the village and go into the shop to get the bow and arrow. 
and it's 980 rupees. 980 rupees for a plot critical item. You cannot kill Goma without this, and they want you to grind near the max amount of rupees. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to think this game might not be as perfect as I remember. I mean, seriously, this is almost as bad as what Tingle does to you in Wind Waker. Seriously. I refuse to pay for this bow. No. Lower the price or I am just taking the bow and going away. You got that, shopkeeper? Look at this guy. He looks so weird. I'm just gonna... Wait. You can actually... You can actually shoplift. Heck yeah, I'm proud of myself. 980 rupees. I'm not paying for that. I gotta use rupees on other things, like, um, bombs, I guess. Anyways, with the bow and arrow in hand, we can finally defeat the twin Gomas. I have no idea why they decided to stick another mini-boss in here, but they did. I suppose this is the mini-boss that spawns the portal to the beginning of the dungeon when you kill him, because after this, we're gonna have another half of the dungeon to deal with. It only takes a couple of arrows, but this mini-boss is seriously annoying because you have to actually wait for his eyeball to open up, and it's completely random whether or not he decides to open it up and let you hit him. Seriously, if he just kept it closed the entire time, Link would never win, but he has to open it in order to shoot one single fireball at you. Otherwise, he will just move side to side and occasionally try to ram you. So with Goma out of the way... We can finally move on, and in this underground section, you have to realize that you can also hook shot onto those weird heads. I suppose they're the most odd-looking thing in the area, so of course you would be able to hook shot onto them. And if you've got a key, you can move on to the next part of the dungeon, and thank goodness, the boss room. I can finally stop filling dead air. The boss is a sort of... Not really a catfish. It would have been interesting if it was a catfish, but it's actually more of a... some other kind of fish. The gimmick with this guy is that his tail will swing wide around the room. You can actually avoid it completely by hiding in the corners, but you have to come out of your safe spot, because the way you beat this guy is to use the hook shot to pull him out of those holes that he pokes his head out of, and then slash him rapidly with a sword. Strangely, when you pull him out, his weak point has this giant beating heart on it. I actually don't remember that from the original version of the game. Maybe that was added in the DX version as a clue that you're supposed to slash at it. So this is a semi-decent boss, but it doesn't really last that long, as long as you pull him out and then slash him a bunch. At least he had more health than some of the other bosses. And it looks like you can hit him in any of those segments of his body? I don't know. But with him down, we get another heart container, and we obtain the... What is this instrument called? The Wind Marimba. Never heard of that instrument before. Sort of looked like a xylophone to me, but never mind. That's five instruments down, only three more to go, and we can immediately go to pick up another one, because we already have the key to level six. That's going to make Mr. Owl's dialogue sound really strange, as we'll be viewing it out of order. Anyways, we dove under that bridge before, but now it's time to cross over it, as buried underneath the soil next to this owl statue lies yet another secret seashell. I think that's like the second or third time an item has been buried near an owl statue, so I think the game wants you to be digging around every single owl statue in the game. On second thought, I'm probably just imagining it. Anyways, with a hookshot, you can now cross this gap. Apparently, the hookshot can connect to stone as well as wood, Normally, it only connects to wood in the Zelda series, but it works on that stone rock as well, which lets you access the mermaid statue. This was apparently crafted by an artist, with Martha posing for him. I sure hope she was fully clothed. For some reason, though, the artist left out one of the scales, and if you put your scale in the statue, it allows you access to an underground cavern with invisible enemies. Enemies that are revealed by the final item of the trading quest, the magnifying lens, or as I like to call it, Literally the lens of truth before there was a lens of truth. Seriously, this thing reveals invisible enemies and NPCs. Not that there are a lot of those throughout the game, but there are a few of them. One such NPC can be found in the Animal Village, in the DX version anyways. If you have the lens of truth, as I will refer to it from now on, this Zora appears in this normally empty house in the Animal Village. I think in the original version of the game, the house was just 
empty, which is actually really weird. Why did they just leave an empty house? Did they run out of time and didn't get to put an NPC here? I suppose that's what happened, as they did put an NPC here, but it's an invisible Zora. What's up with that? Anyways, if you find him, you get another photograph, and he gives you a hint to something that actually was in the original game. And we will get to that eventually, but not now. I'll save it for later. And now I can get a heart piece that I couldn't get before in the cave in the Animal Village by using a classic Zelda trick, the Bomb Arrow. <clears throat> the Bomb Arrow. What's going on here? Why isn't this working? Oh, there we go. So yeah, if you equip bombs and arrows at the same time and hit both buttons at once, you can use bomb arrows, which basically means firing a bomb attached to an arrow, just like people are doing in Tears of the Kingdom and like you were able to do in Twilight Princess. It all started here. <laughs> you can actually bomb through an unmarked bombable wall and throw a bomb over that gap in order to destroy the block that way, but I like doing it the cool way. And with the hook shot, you can pass over the gap and get the heart piece. Now then, returning to the shrine that we got the level 6 key in earlier, Mr. Owl tells us to go south first, but we've already been there. Buddy, we've already been there. So now it's time to find the other shrine. There's one in the north as well. So we will have to pass through a short maze of bushes to cut through and rocks to crush. And this area can be just a little bit annoying because you'll frequently run into dead ends like that. I have no idea why the map is designed that way. Anyways, um, yeah. Coming up, we'll have another bombable wall, but I really can't afford to spend any bombs on it. It's just got a fairy fountain inside anyways. I'll tell you right now what's in there because I'm not going to show it off later. To get into the shrine, you first have to find an underground passage, which you get by passing through an Armo statue. And uh, luckily, I was able to use invincibility frames and get through without having to bomb the Armos. And in this room, you're going to notice me do something really strange. So you're supposed to use the hookshot to get over the gap, but I had an interesting thought. Is it possible to beat level 6 before level 5? So I wanted to see if it was possible to clear this gap by using a diagonal jump instead of using the hookshot. And it took me a couple tries, but it turns out... No, I didn't succeed on this attempt. But yes, I did succeed. It turns out you can cross that without the hookshot, so I'm going to go through as much of level 6 as I can without the hookshot to see if it's possible to clear it without the hookshot, because that would mean that you could clear level 6 before level 5. And they do intend for you to have the bow and arrow at this point, because that Armo statue in the Southern Shrine was only beatable with the bow and arrow or spin attack. So, um, yeah. Welcome to level 6, the Face Shrine. Basically, it's divided into two halves, a left half and a right half. You'll want to take the left half first, as that's where the dungeon item is. This dungeon introduces whiz robes, which coincidentally were also introduced in level 6 in Zelda 1. Annoyingly, however, they got a buff. They can only be killed by bombs and arrows, which I am starting to run low on because trying to do the bomb arrow trick drained my stock. Actually, you know what? I don't think I can do this dungeon without bombs, so I'm actually going to have to go back to the village and stock up on more bombs. I'm sure the shopkeeper won't mind the fact that I kind of stole the bow. I'll pay him back. Okay, apparently not. I guess I will have to find some bombs in the dungeon itself. While I try to find some bombs to start doing the puzzles with, I would like to point out something interesting about this dungeon. We do not have the map yet, but when I get the map, you will see that the dungeon is in the shape of a face. I mean, it's called the Face Shrine, right? So what's interesting is, you find the dungeon item in the left half of the face, and the boss is in the right half of the face. Now, you may be familiar with the common theory that the left half of the brain is analytical and logical, and the right half of the brain is creative. I didn't do a whole lot of research on the subject, so from what I've read, that theory is not really accepted as fact nowadays. However, it would have been accepted as fact when this game was made, so I'm thinking that maybe the developers read that theory and then structured this dungeon around the idea of the left half of the brain versus the right half of the brain, because the left half is where the dungeon item and all of the puzzles are solved, and the right half is where both the mini-boss and the boss are located. It's an interesting idea. 
Anyways, in this underground area, we have a new enemy. This weird-looking flashing ball thing. Don't stare at it for too long. And I have not hit the crystal switch, so I have to backtrack and plant a bomb here, and yeah. This dungeon was really annoying for me, because if you do not hit the crystal switches correctly, then you could find yourself blocked from moving forward, and you have to backtrack a bunch. It really wasn't working for me, and I haven't played this dungeon in a long time, and I wasn't using a guide or anything, so that probably contributed to why I was getting lost so often. So expect a lot of jump cuts from here on out, or at least fade-in transitions. Here's the stone beak, maybe it'll help us out a little bit. Get that owl statue to start talking. Anyways, in this room, uh, I actually forgot at first that you have to hit the door with a pot to open it up. Yeah, it's really annoying when that happens because you wouldn't think to do it and- OH NO! THE COMPASS! AGAIN! Those... Tricky developers hid the compass exactly where they thought you would not think about it for too long. But at least there's a bomb pickup. I'm kind of running out of things to say. So, I just move forward and that room's going to be very annoying in the future. Watch out for that. And oh goody, I have to go back and hit the crystal switch again. Shame that I did not hit it before moving on, because why would I think that I have to hit this crystal switch? Oh boy, oh boy. You know, I liked it better when those crystal switches were restricted to like one or two rooms. Here's another one of those rooms where you have to kill all the enemies. Luckily, it's just two simple whiz robes, and you could shoot them with arrows, but I seriously recommend learning the timing for planting a bomb to destroy them that way, because it's much easier to use just one bomb to wipe out several at once. This bow and arrow method is not really working, especially since it very often causes you to get hit by their spells. These guys were seriously annoying in Zelda 1, and they're starting to annoy me here as well. So, here's the bomb method. If you learn the exact timing for when to plant the bomb, which is basically right after they disappear, you can blow them up that way. And in this room is the second power bracelet. Now we can lift very large objects, which basically means we can lift those statues in the center of the room you're seeing right now. The second power bracelet really doesn't have any use outside of this exact dungeon, so it's kind of a waste of an item. It would have been really nice to find the bow here, and then not center the puzzles around those giant blocks that you have to lift. And most annoyingly, you have to use it to lift this, and use it on the door to open it up and get into this room as well, where you will find 100 rupees. Sure is nice to find all this money after I've already stolen the bow, but there you go. There's another one in this chest as well. Fifty more of them. It's almost as if if I had found all of this before having to buy the bow, I wouldn't have thought about stealing it. And this is the worst puzzle in the game. It's not even a puzzle. You have to throw these chess piece looking things, and if you are lucky, they will be standing upright and that will cause the door to open. Yes, it's complete RNG. This was changed in the remake to not be RNG. There's a bit of a science to how you throw them as far as I know, but I haven't played the remake. And up those stairs you can find another secret seashell in an area of the game that we will not be seeing in this entire playthrough because I never thought to actually go over there. I didn't need to go over there for any seashells, so we're not going to be seeing that part of the game. Sad face. Now that you have the dungeon item, you can go into the right half of the dungeon, and as soon as you do, there's a room with annoying floor tiles. The one thing that I wish they hadn't carried over from A Link to the Past. But no matter, you just stand in the corner and swing your sword a bunch, or just run around the room like this, and eventually the door opens. I think if you don't lift the pots, they start flying at you as well, which is funny at least. And again, you have to throw the thing at the door. Honestly, after the first time, there's no real reason to make that the puzzle, because if the player already knows what to do, then they already know what to do. It's not exactly rocket science. Anyways, another kill room where we have to get rid of all the whiz robes. You can see that using bombs to do the job is very, very efficient. And if you head south, this room has a very interesting puzzle. You actually don't need to backtrack in order to hit the crystal switch to get through here. In fact, if you hit the crystal switch, I think you're blocked from moving on. What you're actually supposed to do is land on that specific tile and then use the rock's feather to jump to the other tile and that will get you over the tile and into the next part of the dungeon, which contains a chest with Crazy Tracy's secret medicine. Why?
I already have this. It only costed 28 rupees. Why did you put one in the dungeon? Well, that's kind of annoying. It was a complete waste to find it here because I already have it, and you can only carry one of them at a time. You know, I don't mean to brag or anything, but I have been told that Link's Awakening is harder than your average Zelda, but I'm really not seeing it. Anyways, at the end of this passage is a small key. You can use that to go back to the locked door and unlock it. And this series of hallways actually loops infinitely if you keep going north over and over again. It'll loop over for some reason. So, after using a bomb to blow through yet another unmarked bombable wall, we find the mini-boss of the dungeon. I forget what this thing is called, but it likes to throw that steel ball at you, which you can only lift if you have the level 2 power bracelet, and naturally, you have to throw it back at him in order to defeat him. It's almost like a game of catch, with very dire consequences if you do not catch. And lifting this ball is actually really annoying. <laughs> The hitbox on it is a little bit strange, and uh, you have to be very precise when you actually throw it in order to land a hit on the mini-boss. And also very annoying is that the ball can get stuck in that little gap where you just came through with a bomb. So it's gonna take me a couple of throws to fight this guy and defeat him. And he actually dodges sometimes, and as you can see he managed to throw it into that little gap, and oh goodness, I'm actually low on health. I can't get hit more than two times, or I will have to actually use the medicine, but he was only one hit away from being defeated anyways, and luckily he actually drops two fairies because the steel ball also turns into a fairy. I have no idea why it does this, but hey, we're almost out of the dungeon, only a couple more rooms to go. So yes, if you go north from this room, you'll end up in a previous room. You're actually supposed to lift up one of the statues and find a yet another underground passage. So after jumping over these enemies, which I failed to do, of course, if this were a Mario game, I would be very upset because I would have to go back to the beginning of the stage. And then this room just has absolutely nothing but ladders in it, and uh, then you find a room with even more floor tiles. How nice. But you can actually go south in order to avoid dealing with these guys completely, which actually you can't because if you survive all these tiles, a key appears. So with all those guys out of the way, we can either head north through the door or south. And uh, after I manage to actually make that jump, we will head south and find... Ah, oh, it's one of these enemies again. I forgot to mention that if this thing successfully sucks you into it, you'll fall down a hole and wind up at the beginning of a dungeon. Kind of like a wall master. But yes, you have to actually jump and slash at the hole in the floor, which doesn't seem very intuitive, but there it is. Arrows don't work. They just get sucked up by the thing, apparently. And in this room, we have a Beemos, which will fire a laser at you if it sees you. And uh, you're going to want to be very careful around that, because you have to bomb the Wizrobe in order to advance to the next room. And the next room has the boss door, so I'm going to have to come back later with a boss key, which I don't have quite yet. But you can light these two torches to cause those two bubbles to turn into fairies. I don't know how that works, but there you go. If you need a health refill, that's what you should do. So use that key to get through to this room, and you have to, yet again, throw the statue at the door in order to open it up. This dungeon has really awful puzzles, I just want to say. And now it's time to hope for some luck. You have to get the two night pieces to stand upright, which is complete chance, might I add. Now maybe there was merit to the Switch remake of this game after all. Alright, moving on, we have yet another underground passage. This one's got thwomps. Easiest way to get past them is to learn from Mario's example and dash as quick as you can. That was pretty easy. And in this room, we find Pole's voice. We've seen this enemy before, but now we actually have the ocarina. So now you get to do the classic Zelda trick of killing Pole's voice with an instrument. This actually does work in Zelda 1, but you needed the Famicom microphone in order to... Yeah, there's more bomb snakes. I'm not doing that right now. I don't have bombs. Actually, I do have bombs, but... I just don't feel like killing bomb snakes. I hate fighting them without the trick that you do in Zelda 1 with the Dodongos. It was much easier to fight them that way. Anyways, we have yet another room. This room is a complete trap, and I don't recommend coming in here because it closes the door behind you, and you have to uh, hope for some luck to get the door open again. And the chest is nothing special. I mean, 
it's more money, but you can see that I'm capped on rupees. So, this chest having 200 is a complete waste. No, I am not ecstatic. This won't fit in my wallet. Anyways, after killing these bomb snakes, which I am not going to bother showing you because you've seen this a dozen times before, you can move on to this room where, unfortunately, you do need the hookshot, so completing this dungeon before level 5 is unfortunately not possible. It's just one single puzzle that you need the hookshot for. And in this room, if you weren't satisfied throwing pots at doors, now you get to know the joy of throwing pots at chests to open them up. Yeah, I don't know how you're supposed to figure that out, maybe the statue on the wall has a clue. But seriously, throwing a pot at the chest? That doesn't make any sense, and why was there a crystal switch there? The crystal switch isn't going to be used for anything. Anyways, backtracking to the boss room, we have a very interesting boss. This boss is literally a face in the floor, and to damage him, you have to use bombs. That's the only way to hit him, apparently. Yeah, you can't stab him with your sword, but apparently bombs are okay. This guy is called Facade, and I think that's a pun on face, because he's a face, so he's technically a face sod. It's a really awful pun. Defeating him is not that difficult. In fact, I'm not even going to show the second phase of the fight where he starts trying to open holes in the floor because he's dead long before then. This boss actually goes on to appear in the Zelda Oracle games, which canonically actually take place before Link's Awakening. Like, I know people probably don't care about timeline stuff, but I think it's nice that Link's Awakening, the Oracle games, and A Link to the Past all exist on the same part of the timeline. But I don't really have enough time in this video to talk about it, so maybe later. Anyways, that's going to do it for this video. We beat the boss of level 6, and we've got the next instrument, which is a triangle. That's a weird instrument. I've seen them a couple of times, but I don't really know much about them. That'll do it for this video, everybody. Next time, we will take on level 7 and potentially level 8. Depends on how long it took me to clear those. And uh, the end of the game is starting to approach. So I'll see you for the next video. Later, everybody.